So we see the continuation in his work. He begins his third missionary journey. But let me go to a third statement. We're going to spend most of our time here. Let me talk to you this morning because this is what missionary conference is all about. His commitment to the work. And let me ask you a question. Not as a church, but let me ask you, not corporately, but let me ask you an individual question. Are you committed to the work? I mean the work of Christ. Are you, are you committed to being a part of helping the nations hear the story of Christ? Both in your going, in your giving, in your praying. Well, what is the work of the missionary? I still believe it's the Great Commission. You can't improve it. Go therefore, make disciples to all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teach them to observe all things I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the age. The Apostle Paul spent a year and a half in Corinth, which was a long time. He spent three years in the city of Ephesus. He spent more time over four missionary journeys in the city of Ephesus than anywhere else. Well, the Bible begins by telling us about a person there, a mighty preacher, and it gives a description of an individual by the name of Apollos. The Bible teaches he was from Alexander, which is in Egypt. Uh, Egypt, Alexander was, it was a famous center for learning. Some of the great schools of thought were there, both philosophical and theological. Uh, they were reported as having the largest library in the world with possibly as many as 900,000 books and scrolls. The city was founded in 332 B.C. by Alexander the Great, population of about 600,000 people, which would have made it one of the largest cities of the world in the first century. It was a city of religious and philosophical significance. It was the birthplace of the Septuagint. You may say, what in the world is the Septuagint? Take your Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and translate it to Greek. Why is that so important? Because now they have a copy to place into the hands of the Greek-speaking Jews, the Hellenists, and also into the people of the land of Greece who did not have a copy of God's Word so they took it. So it's very important now that the Old Testament, the Hebrew language is being translated, the Septuagint, into the Greek language. And the birthplace was Alexandria, Egypt. Men such as Clement, Origen, lived there. And it's thought that possibly Apollos was influenced by the teaching of Philo, a first century theologian. Listen to this. Where he may have adopted his allegorical teaching of Scripture. What is allegorical? It's a story in which people, things, and happenings have another meaning, often instructive, such as a fable. It's sort of a, one of those stories you hear and then you say, and the moral of the story is. It's a great art. Well, the Bible says several things in describing Apollos. First of all, it speaks of his eloquence. Uh, the Bible says he was eloquent, implies he was learned. It means he was skilled in words. I would call him a man that we would consider a wordsmith. They don't just say it, they have a real special way of saying it. I've heard people that are wordsmith before, and everybody would just sit there spellbound, and I think, I said the same thing he said, I just didn't say it the way he said it. Uh, he was a man of reason, of speech, a man of words, a man of ideas. Uh, he had a special capacity to explain his thoughts in ways that captured the intellect and swayed the emotion of his listener. So he was eloquent. But the Bible says he was effective. The Bible says he was mighty in the scriptures. The word that is used for mighty is where we get our word for dunamis, which means dynamite. It means, listen to this. He was not only eloquent, very intellectual, but he was powerful. I love it when you find a person that is very intelligent, but yet at the same time, very powerful. These same two words were used of Moses. In Acts 7, the Bible says, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in word and deed. By the way, the word mighty there means he was strong. If someone would have said in the first century, Have you heard Apollos? They would respond and say, Yes, and you're talking about a strong preacher. Listen to this word used by Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the exact same Greek word. And he said to me, that is, God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest on me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecution and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, here it is, then I'm strong, dunamis. I have the power of God. 
It means that God uses weakness more than he does strength. Wow. So it speaks of the fact that this great preacher was a powerhouse for the gospel. He was eloquent, learned, educated. He was effective, powerful. But listen to this. He was expressive. He could express himself. The Bible uses the word there in verse number 25. It says he was uh, instructed in the way of the Lord. He was well educated. Uh, he had the power of God on his life. He was full of God's energy. And then he was enthusiastic. The Bible says he was fervent in spirit. That means his enthusiasm boiled with excitement. He was excited about the things of God. That word's only used one other time in the entire New Testament. You find it in Romans chapter 12 and verse 11. It says, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. It means that his soul was fired with enthusiasm for the things of God. It would mean this when somebody says, so, what's your passion in life? Listen to me carefully. It was always Jesus. Now, he may have had some other passions, but nothing fired his soul like the things of God. And so he was passionate about Christ. It was a zeal coupled with action. Apollos had light, heat, and action. And then the Bible says that he was one that would preach exactly. I want you to see this. This is great theology if you'll stay with me in this text. This is plowing a little deeper, but I want you to stay with me. The Bible says he was instructed in the way of the Lord. He was fervent in the spirit. And he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord. Now, did you see that? He spoke accurately the things of the Lord. But then it makes this statement. It says, though he knew only the baptism of John. It's, it, what it really means is what he had to say, he had a perfect understanding of. This word that is used there accurately is used by Herod when he said, you go out and find the Christ child, and when you find him and you have searched and found him, bring me word again. It means I want you to come back and with all accuracy, with all exactness, tell me exactly. So he had taught accurately. Apollos was a combination of fact, fervor, and great force. Now, let me ask you something. Pastor Johnny, if all those things were said about the description of Apollos, how could you possibly say, but hold on just a minute, let me tell you about his deficiencies. Hey, would you look this way for a moment? I really need to make sure I get this message across. Regardless of all of those descriptions of Apollos, he still had his deficiencies. There's some of you that feel the devil has told you you can't witness and can't share what you know because you don't know it all. This is going to shock you. No one does. But he was willing to share what he could with what he had. So what's the deficiency? The Bible says, though he knew only the baptism of John. Why is that a deficiency? I'm going to make a statement. It's a single liner. It'll help you understand the theology of Apollos. He was incomplete in his knowledge, but he was not inaccurate in what he presented. There's all the difference in the world. What he's preaching was the gospel. It was just not the complete gospel. See, Apollos knew the Old Testament scriptures well and was able to teach them with eloquence and power. The only problem was that he was declaring an incomplete gospel, not inaccurate. His message got as far as John the Baptist and then it stopped. He knew nothing about Calvary, the resurrection of Christ, or the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. You may, how in the world can that happen? Well, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. Those who were baptized looked forward to the coming of the Messiah, but he had not come at that time. Listen to Acts chapter 19 and verse 4. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. John announced a future baptism of the Holy Spirit. He said, I baptize you with water. But the one coming after me will baptize you with the Spirit. When would that happen? It would happen at Pentecost. It would happen on the day of the birth of the church. He said it in Mark chapter 1 and verse 8, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11, Acts chapter 1 and verse 5. Apollos knew about the promises, but he did not know of its fulfillment. Why? Because he lived down in Alexandria 
Egypt. He had not heard. We believe that some of John's disciples went down there and preached that, listen, he's coming. You better repent and get ready for his coming. So he did. He embraced all the light that he knew. And listen to this. And any time you embrace the light that you come to know, God will increase the light. So when they, they came in and they heard him preach, he's got your Bible open, verse 26, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. What was he telling them? There's a Messiah that's going to come. He is going to make a way for you. The Old Testament, he could reach over there with his allegorical reproach and he could approach and he could tell about all of the major things that the Bible said about this coming Messiah. And he could, with word pictures, help them to understand. Powerfully, he would do it. But then the Bible says that Aquila and Priscilla, which are two lay people, heard him. They took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now, there's a deficiency he is incomplete, but he's not wrong. He just needs to know more about what's happening. So notice the, direct, the directions that were given to Apollos. I'm going to use three words to describe them. First of all, preciousness. The Bible says Aquila and Priscilla heard him. They took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Jerry Vines taught me years ago, and you've heard me say it over and over again, the Christian never has a luxury of being unkind. What if Aquila and Priscilla had been unkind? They would have sat there, and while he was preaching to those Jews and trying to get those Jews saved, they would have wrote notes. Listen, to he, he don't he even don't know about what Christ has done. How could he know until somebody had told him? And by the way, let me be real quick to say, here's one of the men, he is described as probably one of the most educated men of the first century, but he still could learn. And all of us can still learn. See, Apollos had just finished preaching a bold sermon in the synagogue. Now, I, I'm a pastor. I can remember an experience of triumph. I preach, followed by constructive criticism, which tended many times to dampen my triumph. Here's a statement I wrote. Note not only the spirit of approach, the, the spirit in which they approached Aquila by Aquila and Priscilla, but also the spirit of approval by Apollos. As listeners, we can receive a new perception of the fact that whatever we know or however faithful we've been, there's always more to learn. But a true sign of spiritual maturity is the undefensibleness and a willingness to grow. Apollos was a wordsmith. He could have responded back to them and said, don't be telling me what I don't know. But then they begin to say, did you know? You, you haven't heard anybody since John the Baptist. And you know that John the Baptist was beheaded. But have you heard? He did come. Did you hear that he went to the hill called Golgotha, the place of the skull, and he did die? And as it had been prophesied, he didn't stay dead. On the third day, he got up from the dead. And guess what happened? After 40 days and being seen many times after the resurrection, he ascended back to heaven. And if you heard, he did not leave us alone. He sent the Spirit of God. And you know what this man did because of his humbleness? He said, to God be the glory. I want to know all of him I can. And he embraced that truth. And then they said, and by the way, you wouldn't believe how God has been working in the city of Corinth. And it instilled such a hope within his heart that if you'll read the next verse, he said, I want to go there. I want to go to Corinth. There ought to be preciousness in our approach to help people. There ought to be humbleness in our heart in receiving the help. And there ought to be teachableness in our heart. 